like to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 10. Ezra chapter 10. I have a little bit lengthier of an intro than usual, so I want to go ahead and pray first thing. Father, we come before you in this moment, in this place, and we ask that you would do a work. This is not a request that is new to us. It's a request that repeat. We beg upon your mercy once again. And we ask that you would use our gathering, that you would use the reading and preaching of the word to do a work in our minds and in our hearts. That you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would convict us of sin, and that you would show us what to do when we leave this place. For your glory, for the building up of the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I've mentioned this on a number of occasions as we've worked through Ezra and Nehemiah that Ezra and Nehemiah has a tendency to be used by its readers and preachers as a, a sort of a how to manual for how to start a revival. It, it's something of a a truism that if, if you're a church leader and you want to you know, have a building program, you call it Project Nehemiah, that kind of thing. If you want to foster a sense of revival, you know, you, you talk about Ezra and his preaching of the word and, and that kind of thing. It's okay, let's do what they did and hope we get the results they did. And I kind of want to go, did you read the whole book? The results are uh, kind of mixed, actually. There's just something about that take on Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, the how-to manual, manual for how to start a revival, that, in my view, seems a little off. It seems more appropriate to me to think of Ezra and Nehemiah as a meditation on why revivals fail. As I explained to you when we started out in the series, we really need to think of Ezra and Nehemiah as one complete work. Our series, our sermon series does not end here at the end of Ezra, and we're going to go right along into Nehemiah. The literary structure of Ezra and Nehemiah shows, it's written in such a way that we can see this is meant to be read as one work. We have three stories that follow a similar pattern. We have three waves of return that that happened because God has moved in the heart of the pagan king and under the leadership of Zerubbabel and then Ezra and then Nehemiah, there will be a return of the people to the land. They will encounter some hardships as they deal with the people of the land who are already there. And then there'll be this response and a call to action and the results are kind of mixed. And all three stories follow this basic pattern. And it's really not until the end of Nehemiah that we get a, a lengthier meditation on what's God really trying to say to us. But I do think that at this point, nearing the end of Ezra, we do already have some answers to the question. Why do revivals fail? Well, what have we seen so far? We've seen community-wide effort to restore the altar and the temple. And that was a great moment, wasn't it? And indeed, we would recognize that such a, a work, a great work of that, would be incredibly inspiring for our worshiping community. To have a place to call home. To have a place to dedicate to the Lord and say, this belongs to the Lord. To have a place that is a, a visual aid, a monument to the great work that God has done. Indeed, Buildings and temples and altars, they can inspire us. One of the little details I picked up on many years ago when I got to go into Turkey, we went into a lot of ancient churches. And I noticed after a while that I did the same thing in every one that I entered. I looked up. Because there was something about the architecture itself which communicated its theology. We want, we want to have a an upward gaze at a holy God when we enter this space. 
I've I shared with Jill on a number of occasions, if God decides that he wants to do something huge here at Darby, who knows if he will? I don't know. But if he does, and we have to have that conversation of what do we do with all these people? And we have to talk about building a building. You know, I don't want a box. I want a beautiful sanctuary. Because I want a building that says something about our theology and the holiness of the God that we serve. Indeed, buildings do matter on some level. They communicate things and they can inspire us, but they fall short because buildings and temples cannot change the human heart. We all know that sometimes a change in scenery can do wonders for those of us who are in grief. You know, it, it's something of a truism again that, you know, a, a bad breakup, what's the first thing you do? Cut your hair, you know? Just you gotta change things up a little bit. A change in scenery maybe will, will do something for you. And, and maybe that's true. You know, maybe things aren't going well in your life and you just wanna hit reset. So you say, I'm leaving this city and I'm going over here, I'm getting a new job and I'm gonna find a new church and a new community. You just wanna hit reset. And maybe there are times where something like that is of great value and, and we want a new start. And a change in geography can, can be a good thing. But a new location cannot confer upon the traveler a new heart. When we consider what's going on in the world, let's be honest, sometimes we, it can stir up a lot of emotion in us, a lot of hope, a lot of grief. You know, it's like every election, it's like we're basically voting for either the Messiah or the Antichrist. And geopolitical victory, when it comes, can be really exciting and maybe inspire a season of renewal. Like, Maybe God's doing something. And we have literally seen in this book on multiple occasions, God move in the heart of the most powerful ruler on the face of the earth. That's exciting. But that cannot change the human heart. We might think that we just need to take God at his word and, and just do what he says. You know, he gave us rules to follow. We should follow them. That's pretty good advice. Indeed, righteousness exalts a nation. And I think that God's laws are not just just. They're not just true. They are wise. And if we make it our resolve to do what God has told us to do, that's a good path to be on. But following rules cannot change the human heart. Jesus didn't say, obey me, and then you'll learn to love me. He said, if you love me, you will obey me. The order counts. So here we are at the end of Ezra. It's been nearly a century since that decree of King Cyrus first got this whole story off to a start. And the expectations of the people could not be higher. Because if you know the stories of your own people, you know that it was less than a century before that, that tragedy befell the people of God. That as a consequence of their rebellion, God had to bring justice even to his own people. And, and so they were taken off into exile, but not without the promise. It's only going to last 70 years, and then I'll bring you back. And with that whole package of prophecies, expectations are set that God is going to bring the people back into the land, that he's going to give them prosperity, that one day all the nations will come into that city, that revived city, and they will join you in the praise of Yahweh, that there is this great figure of prophetic expectation. We know him as the servant of the Lord. We know him as the son of man. We know him as Messiah. That person is coming. Our, our, our great high king and priest is coming. And all through the story of Ezra, we get the sense that the reader wants to say, keep your eye on this guy. Keep your eye on this guy. Maybe he's the Messiah because look, he's a king. Look, he's a priest. And if the temple's being restored, have, have you read about the prophecy of the temple in Ezekiel? That glorious temple? 
I mean, the excitement at times, I think, had to be off the charts. But two things are missing. Two things prophecies, prophesied have not come to fulfillment. The Messiah hasn't arrived. And many of these prophecies of prosperity and of the nations rejoicing and praising really do hinge on the arrival of that figure. No Messiah, no true global kingdom. But embedded in all those prophecies is what is probably the key pro prophecy. And I've already said this. I've read about this from Jeremiah 31. So I'm going to go over to Ezekiel 36, where we basically get the same promise. It is the promise that one day God will grant to his people new hearts. That thing that has always been missing. That thing that no building, that no geopolitical victory, that no amount of rule following could ever do. This is the promise through the prophet Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 24. I will take you from the nations and gather you from the, all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. This more than the expectations of a temple or an altar or a city is the real hope of the prophet prophecies. A new heart, a new spirit. So we can identify a handful of reasons for why revivals fail, but I think at the end of the day, it all boils down to one thing. That without new hearts and a new spirit, which is something only God can grant, revivals always fail. And so we must understand, if we pray for revival, I do, or when I think about what's going on in the world, I'm like, there's no hope in our politicians. There's no hope in our parties. There's no political platform that's going to get us out of this mess. Look at that, P, 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 right? Our only hope, right? It's revival or bust, best I can tell. But I wonder when I say that, I wonder when you say that, if you're really grasping the totality of what you're saying. Because revival hurts. The, the spiritual open heart surgery that's involved is hard. And that true revival, which manifests itself in action, is hard. When we say revival or bust, we're not saying God's going to just pour out some blessing and bring rain to the land and heal everything and it's all going to be good and easy and great and sunshine and lollipops. No, what we're saying is there's no way out of this mess that will not cost everything. Revival hurts. Revival is expensive, spiritually primarily, but often otherwise. So here we are at the end of Ezra 9, and we know, because Ezra has recognized it, that God has brought a work of revival to the people. He calls it a little reviving. And like I said last week, that wonderful prayer that we have in Ezra is not a prayer for revival. It's the prayer of one who has been revived. And Ezra's not alone. There's a small remnant of people in whom, through whom God has worked, who are spiritually revived. And so they are gathered around their pastor, their priest, and he is articulating the prayer of the revived. 
And what I really wanted to establish that last week is that that real revival starts with the heart. But real revival, of course, goes beyond the heart. And we, so we're wondering here as we go into chapter 10, is this going to amount to anything? Will it endure? So what I want to do here as we now turn to Ezra 10 is I want to do a, a pretty rapid exposition of the text and then we'll return to this question about why revivals fail. So I've got a few sections here. This should be up on the screens for you if you'd like to follow along. This is just an outline. Verses 1 and 2, we see the people confess. So last week was Ezra's prayer confession. Here we're going to see what the people do about it. Read along with me verse 1. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land, but even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. They're saying we messed up but we remember that our God is merciful. And that's our hope. It's interesting to me that Ezra doesn't pray that great prayer of chapter 9 and then turn to the people and tell them, now you should feel what I feel. Now you should do something. He doesn't urge them to act at all. They have been so impacted by Ezra's prayer, they are the ones that stand up. They respond, they have seen God at work in Ezra, and they're affected by it. So he's inspired them to act. He didn't actually have to call them to act. And these next few verses are not going to be with Ezra telling them what to do. It's going to be the people saying, this is what we need to do. Ezra, help us do it. It's, it's more of that flavor. So Shechaniah is the person who speaks up and sort of gives a voice to the the bitter grief of the people who have begun to recognize the nature of their sin. Now, when we read in our English Bibles, they articulate their sin, their, their faithlessness as having married uh, these foreign women. The word in Hebrew here for married uh, is not the usual word for marriage, which means this seems to be describing something other, th other than a covenant marriage. The word here literally means given a home which seems to be pointing to something a little bit different than a covenant marriage. It's more like an illicit relationship of some kind, a cohabitation. They have brought women into their homes under false pretenses, under rebellious pretenses. Keep that in mind. So when we get to verse 3, we now see the people, you know, putting their, putting this, what they've said into action. So we see the people submit. Not just words, but actions. Verse 3. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra rose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. So we see here, you know, it's not enough to just say, I'm sorry. Just saying, I'm sorry, doesn't really fix anything, though that is important. True repentance manifests itself through action. And so I believe Shechaniah is still speaking here, says, this is what we're going to do. And Ezra says, all right, now do it. Make an oath that you'll actually follow through and do it. In verse 3, again, another key little phrase I want to point out so we really understand what's going on. He doesn't say divorce. He says put away. And again, this is just another clue to me that what's really going on here is not covenant marriage with the people of the land. It's illicit cohabitation that they have brought into their homes. And so the response is not to divorce because you can't divorce someone if you're not married to them. What they actually are told to do is to put them away. It's different. And in verse 4, I think it's very interesting, this phrase, be strong and do it, sort of at least calls to my mind the, the words of Joshua. 
you know, you're about to go into the land, be strong and courageous. It's a refrain that we encounter frequently when the people of God are told and to um, cleanse the land of the inhabitants. And now the people are being urged to cleanse themselves of these illicit relationships. And there's some similar language that's being used here. And as we work through this text, I'll show you, I think there are even more allusions to the story of Joshua. We'll get to that in a moment. I just want to pause here and say, I wonder, are, are any of you sort of bristling a little bit about what we've read? I, I think that this is a struggle for the modern reader. It sounds harsh. It sounds mean. And I just want to get this out there right off the bat and say, you know what? If you feel that way, it is not because your moral intuitions are superior to those of the Bible or the Bible itself. If you have that moral intuition, it is a testament to the fact that God and his word have changed your way of thinking. If you look at this story and go, what about the women and children? Congratulations, the Bible has changed the way you think. Because throughout history, that's not how people think. It, we think of James, right? What's true religion? Care for the widows and orphans. You read through the Old Testament and constantly, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph, there's this urge that these laws... Don't forget to take care of the foreigner, the stranger, the alien among you. God's laws, Old and New Testament alike, are very much centered around love and good deeds towards those of the house of God, but also to those who are not of it. If you've got that value, if you've got that instinct to go, what about the women and children? You didn't get that from secular system. You got it from the Bible. But we do still have this issue. So I think we need to consider the wider biblical counsel on the topic. Turn to the New Testament. What does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 7, 12. If any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. All right, so he describes the situation. You know, we know that he says you shouldn't enter it this way. Don't be unequally yoked. But if you find yourself in that condition... If your unbelieving spouse is willing to stay with you, accept them. Malachi 2, which I remind you, Malachi is a contemporary of these events, speaking prophetically around these very events, we get that famous phrase of, from God himself, God hates divorce. This is modern day in Ezra. And of course, we need to have that conversation from time to time about how do we know, especially when we're reading historical narrative, the difference between what is described and what is prescribed. Right? Just because the Bible says this happened doesn't mean the Bible is saying, and you ought to do likewise. So that can be tricky. But like I said, I also think it's important that we keep in mind the true nature of these relationships. I think we have evidence in the text itself that what has been described is not covenant marriage it is illicit cohabitation and that this response here is about a, a form of separation right putting away these illicit relationships and i also think that we should consider that if someone wants to approach this text with the, that sort of posture of moral grandstanding which by the way i've encountered it I mean, I've, I've looked in, you know, what do people say about this text? And, and you'd be shocked how people want to say that God is an error. That this is a terrible, wicked thing that they're doing. But you're making a lot of assumptions. And you're arguing from silence. The fact of the matter is we simply don't know if and to what extent those women and children were provided for. Because the readers of those days wouldn't have read that text and got, thought, oh, what about the women and children, right? right? That, that's a, something we've learned. And so they didn't have to answer that objection. So it just simply didn't make it into the story. It's quite possible that some provision was baked for these women and children, but we don't know. I would also point out that the process for this, it takes three months 
that doesn't speak to me of something that's hasty and revolutionary, but something that's very careful, very intentional, right? There's a structure, there's thought that goes into this, and there's judgment that is rendered on a case-by-case -case basis. To me, that's at least a signal that there was some effort made to make sure this was done well and done right, not in a harsh manner that would leave people out to dry. And we also know from the prophecies and even from Ezra itself that assimilation was a thing. I mean, the problem here is not that they have a different ethnic identity and that's forbidden. The problem is here is that they have different gods. They have different loyalties. And that's what cannot be mixed. And we saw just as recently as Ezra 6, that indeed, at this moment of great celebration, there were the Judahites, but also many peoples of the land who had, key word, separated themselves from their foreign gods and devoted themselves to Yahweh. And so again, the text doesn't tell us, but it's possible that part of what happens in this process is that maybe some of these illicit relationships there was conversion involved. And I have no reason to think that if they separated themselves from those false deities and cleaved to the God of Yahweh, that they would not have been accepted into the worshiping community of God. That being said, I don't want to make it sound like I'm trying to, to brush it, to cover it up, make it look like this isn't tragic. It is. This, this is tragic. This is we might say underwhelming. When I think about revival, I don't think about, yay, relationships being broken. Right? We want repair in our relationships. And I do think that the reader is supposed to, to read this and go, yeah, things aren't really all that they're supposed to be. There's a tinge of sadness in this. Yes, God is doing great things, but look at the cost. Look at the brokenness. Even, even as God is preserving a remnant, even as God has granted a little reviving, there's still brokenness that is in need of repair. And so this is a revival that's sort of mixed. There's great things happening, but there's also still this terrible condition that points to our own depravity. Next, we see Ezra withdraw from the people. This is interesting to me, verse 6. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehonon, the son of Eliashib, where he spent the night, neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. And that if anyone did not come within three days, the order of the officials and the elders, all his property should be forfeited and he himself banned from the congregation of the exiles. Now, this is a pretty extreme fact. He doesn't, he doesn't just decide not to eat. He doesn't even drink. And the picture you ought to have in your mind is, is Ezra's going to think, he, you know, he's thinking, I think, <laughs> something like, okay, this decree is going out. In three days, there's going to be 30,000 people here. Lord, what am I supposed to say? You know, we have that great phrase from the book of Esther we talked about a few weeks ago. That maybe God has brought you here for such a time as this. This is Ezra's moment. Maybe God brought him 900 miles across the wilderness for such a time as this. And in three days, he's going to have to address the people. So he goes into an extreme fast because he wants to hear from God. And I want to point out before we move on to the next section, this is another, another way that I think we should have the story of Joshua and the conquest in the back of our minds. In my English translation here, the ESV, the word here is forfeited. The property should be forfeited. But the Hebrew word is karam. And that's the word that you encounter in the book of Joshua. Whenever we're told that they're to go into these lands and destroy everything, the phrase is either put under the ban, that's literal, or devote to destruction. That word is the word that's used here. If you're a Hebrew in 458 BC and you see that word, you hear that word in the decree, you're thinking of Joshua. You know that what this is all about 
is a, a matter of spiritual loyalty. So this warning that if he doesn't come, his property should be put under the ban, devoted to destruction, is similar to saying, you know, the Canaanites, remember that? You're to, you're to get the same fate, right? This is, a, this is a massive degree. And then he himself is banned from the congregation of the exiles. Okay, so next section, Ezra admonishes the people, verse 9. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said to him, You have broken faith and married foreign women, and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now, then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, it is so, we must do as you have said. For those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, those of scholars who have tried to reconcile the dates, um, one proposal is that this weren't about December 458 BC, if you're interested to know that kind of thing. Verse 11, the word here for confession, same word encountered in verse 1, is an interesting word as well. It's often translated as praise or give thanks. It, which is interesting because there are other words for confession, and, and Ezra seems to have deliberately chosen this word both in verse 1 and verse 11, because in this setting, when we think about confession, he wants us thinking about confession as an act of worship, which is what it is. It's not just a statement about some wrongdoing. That itself is a form of worship. And the call here to separate from the people, again, don't just think of this in legal terms. This is spiritual. This terminology is, is robust all through the Old Testament. This theme of how the people of God are to interact with the people of the land, again, a technical term. They're called to separate. That doesn't mean, that, again, it's not across ethnic guidelines or, or lines. It's about their loyalties to their gods. And they're here called to separate. This is a spiritual separation that they're called to do. So we'll continue. One final section of the narrative we'll cover here. The people follow through. They said they're going to do it. And here in verse 13 we see, yes, they do it. But the people are many, and it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this a task for one day or for two, for we have greatly transgressed in this matter. You know what they're saying? Revival's hard. <laughs> Revival hurts. It's wet and cold, and this is a massive undertaking. But we must do it. Let our officials stand for the whole assembly, let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times, and with them the elders and judges of every city, until the fierce wrath of God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jaseah, the son of Tikva, opposed this, and Meshuam and Shabbatai, the Levite, supported them. I enjoy that. <laughs> so we have these, this ordered system that's put in practice. Here's how we're going to do it. And we have at least two people who have objected. And once again, we don't know why. So there are all kinds of theories. Some say that these are uber righteous people and it's, it's in their zeal and they object because they want it done now. And they don't want a process to, that's gonna take months to, to, be, to be implemented, right? They want something more revolutionary. So maybe this is a righteous zeal. Maybe these people are actually among those who have not gotten right with the Lord and they don't want to do this because they want think they want to maintain the status quo. So maybe they're rebels. You know, we just don't know. But we know that there is not you you um you unanimity. <laughs> but it's close. And so this plan is put into practice. Verse 16, then the return to exiles did so. Ezra the priest selected men, hence the father's houses. According to the father's houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter, and by the first day of the first month, they had come to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. It took three months. 
to get through all these illicit relationships. Three months. Now, in verses 18 through 44, you're going to encounter more than 100 names. That's a little more than I'm going to bite off here today. I'm just going to point out a couple of things very briefly in the summary here. I want to point out first that it's a very, it's a top-down summary. So the first um, person that's brought to our attention is a priest and his family. So we start with the institutional members, the leaders among them, right? It starts there, and, and presumably they are actually uh, adjudicated first. And we see that as a result of their sin, their shame, they bring an offering of a ram, and a lot of people have weighed in, scholars, I think this is probably establishing that this was the pattern. So with all of these households, presumably they would have done the same thing. So it starts with the priest, verses 22, or 20 and 22, we get three more priestly lines, and then we have Levites in 23, singers and gatekeepers in verse 24, and then finally you get to 25, and it's just the commoners. Right, it's all the Israelites, verses 25 through 43. But no, it starts with the leadership at the highest level and trickles down to the commoners. So this problem is addressed at its root. And at its root, it's there in the leadership structure. And I want to point this out too, before we return to that final question. This doesn't solve the intermarriage problem. In a mere 20 years, Nehemiah is going to have to deal with the same problem. You know what that tells us again about revival? Once again, it goes bust. Right? So this puts that question back in the front of our minds. Why, Lord? Why do revivals fail? You know, we need to keep this in mind, too. Not every story has a happy ending. Oh, we want it to. And I think this is a plague upon our modern churches. Right? You had a bad week. Don't you want to come to church and get picked up a little bit? Yeah? But is that really what you need? It might be what you want. But is that what you need? You know what that is? It's deception. Because that's not true. That's not life. Life is pain. Wesley, from the Princess Bride. And, and so if all if I do, if all the shepherd ever does is want to bring you in here and tell you some, some cute little story to make you feel good, I'm deceiving you. And in an honest look at the word of God itself, it's a tragedy. Tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy because of the hard heartedness of men and women like you and me. We need the truth. And so, what we have here in Ezra is another reminder why do revivals fail? Because we fail. And there's no magic bullet, there's no human strategy. There's no inspiring work of art that can change the human heart. And the, the final thought that I'm going to leave you with this and answering that question is that a new start is not a substitute for a new heart. A new start is not a substitute for a new heart. And in some ways, I think I can accurately characterize the narrative of scripture as the story of how we get both a new start and a new heart. God's rescue operation, which began in earnest in Genesis 12, began with one man and his family. And through that one man, God would work over the course of many thousands of years to bring many sons to glory. And it would not happen because they would get better at living life. It wouldn't happen because they would apply the law. In fact, the law was really there just to expose them. To show them for the weak, unrighteous vessels that they were. Time and time again, the people of God would fail. Time and time again, God would pour out mercy. 
Time and time again, God would make possible, he would preserve the integrity of the covenants based on his work, not the work of those with whom he covenants. And there's this great hope all through the scripture that one day this process is going to come to an end. On the first page of scriptures, we find a God who, with but a word, creates the heavens and the earth. And he sets Adam and Eve in a place, a garden of Eden, where we have a, a picture of unity. Heaven and earth meet in this place. He walks with them in this place. And because of sin, that is separate. On the last page of scripture, we have a new heaven and earth. And the people are walking with God. That's our great hope. And there's this phrase, and you might not notice it unless you read through the scriptures quickly, that repeats itself at all these key moments throughout the narrative. Genesis 17, 8, I will give to you and the land and your descendants for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Exodus 6, 7, that I will take you for my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Exodus 29, 45. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God. Leviticus 26, 12. I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. Leviticus 26, 45. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors. Whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. Ezekiel 11.20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. They will be my people and I shall be their God. Ezekiel 14.11, in order that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me and no longer defile themselves with all the transgressions, thus they will be my people, and I shall be their God, declares the Lord. Ezekiel 37, 27, my dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Zechariah 8, 8, and I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. This was the great prophetic hope of the people of God. That one day, all that had been lost, union with Yahweh in the garden, would be restored. Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And that is our hope. You see, that was the, the great prophetic expectation of the people of God in the Old Testament. It is also the great prophetic hope of us, of the church. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Throughout the narrative of scripture, we get the sense that, yes, there's a great day when one day what we just read in Revelation 21 will be true and never not true again. On that great day will be true and true forever. And until then, God is at work faithfully to bring heaven and earth just a little bit closer through his representatives. As God reveals himself, he brings them a little bit closer. And the new covenant's there for us, which Jesus inaugurates on the eve of his crucifixion. There's the deposit of the Holy Spirit for all who have trusted in Christ. And the way Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5, the old has passed away, all things have become new. Right? There's a sense in which we can taste the newness now. 
We can walk in step with the Spirit now. So that until that great day, when we'll, this won't be tricky anymore, the just shall live by faith. And we walk not by sight, but by faith. And so the story that runs from beginning to end up till now is the story of those who received the combination of God because they took God at his word. And that's how we navigate this tension now. We take God at his word. And you know what? We have so many examples throughout the scriptures that God is bringing heaven and earth a little bit closer. And sometimes the people of God can taste it now. Isaiah 41 10. Do not fear, for I am, present tense, with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God, present tense. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you, surely I will uphold you with my right hand. Exodus 34, 31, as for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am for God. Present tense. Psalm 23. You know it as the Lord is my shepherd. Yahweh is my pastor is what the king was really saying. Now, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because he's what? With me. Psalm 46 begins, God is, present tense, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And it ends, the Lord of hosts, angel armies, is, present tense, with us. The God of Jacob, present tense, is our fortress. In the incarnation of Christ, John describes it as this, he tabernacled among us. His name, Emmanuel, means God with us. To quote Captain America, I could do this all day. Because this is the story of the Bible. God, in eternity past, in perfect loving harmony, to the end of time, God with a human family, for all of eternity. The story of Yahweh being our God and we the sheep of his pasture being his people. The loyal subjects of his eternal kingdom. The perfectly cleansed citizens. A kingdom priests and a holy nation blood bought we will be a people who do not con con conquer through strength of arms we are not like all the kingdoms of the world that seek to enforce power to enforce our will we will conquer and we will by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony because revival hurts and it hurts no one more than hurt Jesus Christ. Who suffered and died for you. Who set his face like a flint on that holy place. And for the joy set before him endured that shameful cross. Because revival costs something. I want revival. I want to see that great city made manifest now. I want a taste of it right here in Plain City, Ohio. It will be costly. Because true revival is not a matter of just following a strategy. It's a matter of the heart. And when we pray to God, Lord, would you do a miracle? Lord, would you fix us? Lord, would you heal our nation? Don't stop praying that. But make sure you include, Lord, fix my heart. Lord, I surrender my will to you. Let your will be done, not just to my neighbor, 
but in my life. Well, I could do this all day. I probably shouldn't. So let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would help us not to grow weary of this glorious story. That it would not just be like a fairy tale that we have a sentimental, sentimental attachment to, but that it would be the very driving force of our life to know you and to know you more as we often sing. To, to walk in faith and in light of what you have already done, that you have justified the ungodly by the work of your cross, and that we would learn to walk in that power. It, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So Lord, teach us to walk in your ways not just as a people who are, are resolved to try harder tomorrow, but as a people who have been bought, bought by the blood of Jesus, by the people who are now tabernacles for the very, very spirit of God. Lord, change our hearts, change our minds, bring revival to us. Amen.